We're going to take, in the next 20 minutes, um, 18 minutes, we'll take questions and comments. Um, because we have such little time, I ask that if you make comments, keep them short. Don't do mini lectures. I know academics, we like to do that, uh, but keep comments short uh, and questions kind of as to the point as possible. So I think we'll start out by taking three questions, um, and then we'll see if we have time for another round. Hopefully we will. So um, are there microphones for the audience for questions? Thanks for the wonderful presentations. They were all really interesting. I just have one specifically for Libby. I'm sorry, sorry could, could you uh, introduce yourself so everybody knows who you are? I am currently a lecturer at the University of St. Andrews. Nice to meet you all. Um, just a quick question. I wonder what vertical, a vertical dimension to, of jurisdiction would look like. End of question. No point. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for no grandstanding. Sorry, I'm not accusing anyone of that, but you know the type, right? <laughs> um, Sarah? Um, hi, thank you. That was, those were all really fascinating. Um, my, um, okay. Um, my question is uh, for Ivan. Um, Ivan, as we talked about, I also had experience with the WAPS and some other panels. I'm just curious what your sense is. I was really surprised yeah, because yeah. here you mentioned rangers who had left UWA and were willing to testify against UWA. And I want to just want to know more exactly the situation I'm involved with in the North. Like, how often does that happen? And how big of a risk are they at, do you feel, when they're, when they're doing that, when they're stepping away to, to testify against UWA? OK, Thank maybe you. a third question in the green shirt here. Yeah. And I guess we do need to use the microphone because it's recording, so. And again, if you could introduce yourself before you ask your question. Okay, thank you. My name is Julian Kapumvuti and I'm a student from Memorial University of Newfoundland. So my question is directed to Dan. Um, so with so much information out there, how do we counter the issue of um, data justice and possibly it might take a lot of time to counter this, what strategies can we have in place to ensure that we counter the issue of data justice? Thank you. Um, I think we'll take those three questions, but I'm not sure we have a microphone up here, so we might have to come up to the microphone to answer. Um, <laughs> so the question um, from Ariane, is that right? Uh, was about vertical jurisdiction, uh, and that, when we're thinking about vertical, um, we're thinking about nested, the ways in which like what happens in Durban is influenced by what happens in South Africa, like the, the sort of national jurisdiction. Um, but I think part of that goes back to these debates around scale that took place like a decade ago, that not to take scale for granted, um, that these nestings just actually exist in the world, but to think about ways in which um, they're created and which what happens in Durban can spill beyond what happens in South Africa. So not being sort of too lazy about our understanding of um, the vertical layers of jurisdiction or nestings. But I will add, since I have the microphone, I actually think the stuff on horizontal or adjacent jurisdiction, in my mind, is more interesting, in part because like nobody's talking about it. And I feel like those questions around um, adjacency, they probably impact all of our work, I would imagine, thinking about the ways in which you know, the lands that 30 by 30 wants to designate as protected areas, what's surrounding that? How is it that the surrounding uh, legal designations impact the legal designations within that space? So really kind of thinking about some classic geographical questions about spatial relation, I think is really important. Um, so I think the next question was for Ivan. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah, for your question. Uh, you asked me how often that will happen. Uh, I would say it's rare that it does happen. And uh, this is a case, uh, this case is uh, quite unique uh, it was a case of people that they have worked with. So for one group to say, let's deal away with them, definitely you would understand that not everyone totally agreed with that decision. So that's why you had some groups who are willing to all the consequences, and there are many consequences. Maybe we'll have a chat with you. Yeah, they were willing to undergo all those consequences, but 
be able to speak out, just like the other rangers I showed in, the, in some of my calls, who, as I said, the ones who are active are really tight-lipped. They have their ways how they frame what really happens to take our responsibility, but you have those who were really open to me and they told me this is what the situation is and there, there, there are many reasons why they, 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 they had to open up. So that's how I look at it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, how to cope with all the data which are out there? Um, this is a, a, an important question. Um, there are, I think, three ways we're, we're going to try and do this. Um, we, you can take a few of the environmental justice um, from. You look for the smell, you look for the stink, you look for the sources of cancer, you look for the pattern which shows that there's something wrong, you look for the, the bias in um, the ways in which uh, felons are being discriminated against and you, you, you realise there is something systematic going on. Um, and we will be, um, you, you can use data, you can, o exist, you can use existing data sets, overlay them with um, work which is currently being published and by um, juxtaposing different data sets against each other, you can say that, that suggests there may be problems. So if, if you have, as, as um, colleagues did recently in a, in a, in a paper that was um, published last year, um, we looked at where predicted protected areas um, and areas of restoration overlapped with areas of bad governance. Now, we know the maps of bad governance aren't particularly powerful, but they um, are helpful for pointing out a, a, use, a, a problematic pattern. You can look for the um, common sources and common models which are used across all the different uh, uh, predicted pr prioritization um, mapping exercises um, because there is a lot of commonality. If you can understand the assumptions which goes in, go into those models, that again provides you with a source of the, the systematic bias. And the third thing, you, you talk to the modelers, you talk to the people producing these data because often they're the people who really understand all, a lot of the nuance and want their work to be treated appropriately. It's, it's when their work is used again two or three steps down the line inappropriately without the, the right assumptions and, and uh, uh, nuance built in that that's where some of the problems can arise. So by working with that community, um, you can learn a lot. Yeah, we need to use the microphone because they're recording the Q&A, so it can't pick it up unless there's a microphone here. Yeah. Oh, God. Um, I have a question for Van it's Vanessa, right? Yeah. Um, big advocate for photo voice. I think it's really cool to see how um, your project is using it. My question is about, especially working with like female rangers and using photo voice, questions of power and subjectivity. So when they're pr producing photo voices about their, you know, experiences of the landscape or how they feel about the protected area, these things. How, in navigating those workshops, would you be thinking about the levels of power that they're being subjected to as well, in terms of what they're expected to think as rangers in, in relationship to gender? Because I think that's really fascinating. OK, we'll take two more questions. I'm sorry. Uh, in the center here. OK, thank you. Um, my name is Tembela Vimbi from the South African National Biodiversity Institute. Um, I have a question for the last speaker. Um, um, your study is quite interesting and quite impactful, as I see it. Um, but I wanted to understand, is, it, is there a part of your study maybe you didn't touch on? How does the, the focus on your study and your objectives maybe link into practical change that can be done, like in terms of like policies or what could be practic practically be done from this information that you're gathering? What does that look like in Ugandan legislation and all of that? Thank you. Okay, we'll take one more in the back. Yeah. You. Thank you. My name is Tobias from University of Bern. Um, I have a question. I have a question regarding the um, presentation on Uganda. I've been working in Zambia, and similar things occurred there as well. So I was really uh, wondering how could this be scaled up because this is really an international thing and should also be de dealt with legally on an international level. So I think the scaling up in this context 
I guess is really important because th this is a larger crime and it happens several times. I mean, as, as you also were saying, this issue of people killing themselves when they enter the park, I heard this several times as well, and it's really a, a very problematic thing. It's not just land is taken away by conservation, but there are killings, there are you know, human rights violations that are being done. Then the second one is, is uh, for Dan. Um, I was wondering, Dan, you know, when we look at the work of Morton Chervin, misreading um, uh, or poor, poor numbers, his book regarding GDP and how this is mis misconceptualized. Um, Morton Chervin also says what is missing in this data is da data on subsistence, how subsistence value and production relates to GDP. So I was wondering how we deal with the epistemological glitches that areas are called nature. While in fact these are cultural landscapes, and while in fact these have been or still are sometimes common property, you know, and not just pure nature. So how we deal with this? Because that's a central issue regarding this 30 by 30 thing. Thank you. Okay, so I think we'll take those questions, um, beginning with a question for Vanessa, and then moving to Ivan and then Dan. Okay. Thank you, and thanks for that question. Um, I, it's always nice to hear someone who's excited about photo voice as a methodology. We should have lunch. <laughs> Um, and um, I think we've, we've thought about this quite a lot because we, we have had to apply for all kinds of different ethical um, uh, authorization to do this project. Um, and I think it is, it's really tricky, you know, how do you, obviously we can only be engaging with what people tell us. We can't, um, <laughs> we can't go in there and say this is how you need to think about gender identities and binaries and we, we have to try and understand how people are, are um, reflecting on those gender identities themselves. Um, but I, what we're, so at this point our idea is to just do photo voice with individuals because we feel it could be quite sensitive to try and share this information in a group. Um, so we're going to just do photo voice um, exercises with individuals, with women and with men. Uh, wish us luck in, in finding people who are willing to talk to us. <laughs> um, and then uh, if they're kind of, if they're willing, um, my dream is to try to bring these uh, professionals together after they've reflected with their photographs, after we've had time to kind of bring together a, um, an exhibition, then bring everyone together to, to see if there is some, if we can use uh, their own reflections, if they can use their own reflections to, um, to be reflexive together, do you know what I mean? And, and to sort of try to confront some of these biases. Yeah, thanks. Was it you? I think it was you next. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you. you. Um, for the first question, uh, so in terms of uh, policy and uh, legislation, I'm uh, sorry to say, but I think um, um, I present more like a hopeless picture. Um, First of all, these cases have been presented on the floor of parliament several times. But you would understand that these lo local people have their members of parliament, have their representatives, as I say, they petition politicians. Many times it comes on the floor of parliament and they claim people are disappearing in large numbers. Let's do something about it. Let's have a commission of inquiry. All this has fallen on dead ears. I showed a slide where I'm saying government investigate. That, that was the end of it all. But you also have to understand how the Ghanaian society works. Eh? Uh, we, we live in a country where there's never been any report of investigation done to its logical conclusion. So the question becomes why then would it be done for the case of conservation and missing people? Like, like literally, you could talk to a man uh, who also comes from Uganda and typically ask him if he knows of any report about any mysterious death, any, anything. So when I talked to the lawyer, he told me that um, this is the kind of uh, impunity when you live in a state of impunity, this is what you really see. And for him, he really believes that like this court case, if the judge is bold enough to really uh, speak out and give a tough judgment, perhaps it would send a picture. But in terms of policy and legislation, it's just known, general knowledge, that there's no official kill, short to kill. But it still happens uh, in uh, an animatic bigger scale. I didn't, I didn't get the second question, unfortunately. Uh, sorry about that. 
I repeat again, um, I've been doing long-term research in Zambia in protected areas, and the similar things as you were describing in Uganda, I did also occur there. You know, I was also, um, of course, was not direct witness, but I wit witnessed what happened in one case. I was also writing about it in one, in one of my books in order to show what, what is happening. And I was wondering, because it's not only happening in Uganda, it's happening everywhere, actually how to scale this up, although uh, it's problematic to do it on a national level, perhaps on an international level, this should be brought up for you know, broader fact-finding missions, because mm. then you would have another element. You know, It's not in a national context, it would be in an international context, showing that conservation has this other very, very human rights uh, context, very problematic uh, uh, human rights violations issues. You know. I was just wondering whether you were thinking about uh, yeah, this yeah. upscale. Yeah, 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 so like I said earlier, uh, like just, just quickly coming off my head, like I said earlier, so in the afternoon, uh, Professor Harold Sindela and the rest will present to us a book, a special collection about the militarization, but also possible solutions. So I think, like in this case also, we could also look at ways of how to also write about this, like special collections, where we could tell this story and just show that it's not isolated, yeah? but it's a problem that needs to, the world needs to know about. That's what comes off my mind quickly. I'll hand it over to Dan, but, but really briefly, I think the UN, the UN has a special rapporteur on parks and um, people, and there's a report called Cornered by Protected Areas, I think. I mean, I think the UN is beginning to take some of these issues seriously, which is, would be a scaling up um, beyond individual countries, but still pretty not particularly robust at this point. Uh, so we have a question, a uh, time for Dan to answer the last question. Tobias, thank you. Um, yes, Morton Jervin's ethnography of the construction of GDP is, is um, fascinating work. And I asked Morton um, if similar work had been done on the FAO and on the, their agricultural statistics and the data which um, they collect at a national level, um, which can be really bad at uh, uh, mapping and, and, and measuring what is being produced in peasant farms which are multi-cropping and, and, and these multi-crops are represented as maize alone. And the data are problematic with, with the FAO. And, and yet these data are used to determine the productivity of particular areas which are then used to determine the value of crops which is then used to determine the price of land. And so you get errors built into the way in which FAO data are collected, which then affect the, the, the value, the only the monetary value of, of people's activities. And then, to get to your point about property rights and, and who, who owns what land, you, you, I've also seen estimates of the cost of conservation which are dependent upon buying land for conservation purposes. Um, doing that in Australia, on indigenous people territories, I think that's actually illegal. It's not for sale. Um, so you get all sorts of um, false estimates and, and plans built, built into to, to the exercises. And these are precisely the sort of systematic biases of, of what is missed off in the map in terms of who owns what, who uses what, um, which, is, which is why I would argue for, for a data justice perspective. Okay, uh, we're out of time. Please join me in thanking the panelists uh, for excellent contributions.